Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 17 of our podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project, and it goes in order. We've had such a good time researching it and working on it, and especially bringing it to you. At this point in our story, Constance and Philomena have discovered the author of the mysterious letter is the famed poet Sir Thomas Wyatt. Constance has promised the Earl of Rutland to intercede with his lady love, Thomas and St. John. So we'll start today's chapter of Time's Riddle at Bedford House. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jessie. Chapter 17, Bedford House, in which Constance plays the messenger and dearest sister is named. Constance brooded over the image of the Countess of Lennox, her face like two apples, with a sausage set across the top, her eyes and puckered mouth shoved into the little crevices. The Countess had come to Stoner House some time ago. Her aunt summoned Constance from the garden, and the Countess evaluated her with those little eyes, and then glanced with sympathy at Aunt Stoner. Despite her manner at the tower, surely the Countess of Lennox marked Constance. She had done the bishop's bidding. Should the lady be released and restored to the queen's good graces, the Countess would remember Constance herself and might show her favor. More than likely, fortune would turn against the Countess, and the risk Constance had taken would have been for nothing. Fie, that was wrong. She should not think in this vein. She had gone to the tower and brought the holy bread to the unpleasant woman because it was the bishop's charge because it was right. She did not serve the Countess of Lennox looking for thanks, for promotion. When she had taken care of the poor Lady Marquess of Northampton, she had never thought of preferment. She never thought to gain the attention of Lady Clinton, a person who would see her service to Guzman and the Countess of Lennox's utter betrayal. And the Countess had a viperous temper. Oh, pitikins! Constance put the pillow over her head and then flung it down, making a little popping sound of upset. "'Constance, are you ill?' cried Brigitta as she jumped from the bed with unusual speed. "'It is the sweating sickness. Oh, mercy, mercy! Brigitta, please, I am moving about as any person does in the morning. I am quite well.' Constance patted the bed beside her, but the Swedish girl had already slid in with the two Christinas, shoving them into a sleepy heap. Constance threw on a blanket and sat to compose the note of pretext for her aunt. The Countess's letter would be hidden within and delivered as promised. Constance eked out two pages, then sealed the letter with the Countess's missive tucked inside. Ah! screeched Elizabeth as she ran into the room. The princess is gone. My dear sister has been absconded with. Peace, you goose, ordered Dorodai. Where is the princess? asked Christina Abraham's daughter sitting up. With whom is the more important question? said Anna, Yaren's daughter. Was there a particular man last night? Jesus, Constance thought. This conversation would never take place at Whitehall. I must find her, Elizabeth insisted. Only because you want some bawdy tale to wag your tongue about. How unfair you are, Dordai. I am worried for my dear sister. The room began to debate whether or not to search out Cecilia. Constance, having no opinion in the matter, thought of the Earl of Rutland's ring and the promise to give it to his love. She dressed and set off to find Mistress St. John, maneuvering her way through the long halls. The view through the doorway was unexpected. Haughty Thomason laughed with her maid and held a series of rings to her ears, stuck out her foot for shoes, nibbled on a sweet. Mistress Constance, why do you stand in the hall? Come in, come in! Thomason called out jauntily. La, I misjudged this one, Constance thought. Your spirits are high, mistress. When true love has bowled you over as a pin on the green, your relation must be free, said Thomason. Oh, the sweet Earl of Rutland would be so happy. Mistress St. John, how wonderful that you can share your heart with one who loves you too. Have you ever seen a face that held such lips, that even still they sing to you to kiss? said Thomason. Shall I guess your occupation? Constance laughed. You have been reading love poems. Thomason's expression became serious. There is nothing that can describe the exquisite torture of love except a poem, 
this feeling, a uh, leap's description. Is it that profound? Constance was impressed. And more. Constance could resist no longer. Mistress, I have an unexpected pleasure for you. Thomason clapped and Constance laughed. This was the finest errand she had ever been sent on in her life. She opened her hand one finger at a time, revealing the gold band the Earl of Rutland gave her. Thomason began to quiver. He sent you with a ring. She took it gingerly and kissed it. I can feel the rough skin of his finger against it. Can you really? asked Constance. Oh, yes. Thank you, thank you. Then Thomason regarded the ring closely. Ah, here is the crest. Her expression faded into melancholy. Mistress Thomason, I see how you feel the Earl's absence. He would have spoken with you at the wedding, but he missed you, and he charged me to bring you this. He will attend you soon. I see how you are, Mistress Constance. You are all kindness, but the Earl of Rutland must not come here in any case. It will not go well with my guardian, the Earl of Bedford. Give the gentleman my kindest thanks, but you must tell him not to come here. You do not wish it? Constance asked. But what pain separation will bring to you both? Is there no remedy? I do not see one. Go to him for me. Tell him he cannot come here, I beg you. Then swaying her way over to the bed, Thomason sank down. Love addled a person, thought Constance, as she left the prostrate girl. Thomason was thrilled when she arrived, but now the girl was despair itself. The Swedish princess was still at large. Taking advantage of the confusion, Constance decided to deliver Thomason's message to her lover without delay, and she could post her own letter at the same time. She urged Wynne, who made a brief plea that they should not go running out. They might be missed. The day was cold. Her shoes were thin. Constance pitied Wynne. The girl needed a docile mistress, but Wynne's Catholic loyalties meant there was little choice in who to serve. Constance would send her to the kitchen with a farthing as soon as they arrived at Cecil House. Mistress Constance, are you not the finest friend I have? What news do you bring? Rutland begged, escorting Constance into the library. Sitting side by side with him, Constance had a moment of coy. Your lady has been reading love poetry. Say so. The pimply boy in Oxford appeared at the door. Constance wished the Earl of Oxford, or Rutland himself, would have the consideration to introduce that bad-skinned lad. Oxford burped and flung himself on the table, his face only a few inches from Constance. Rutland covered that face with his palm and pushed Oxford. Away, you load of rot! I want a privy moment with this thin her. Always you want. Such is the curse of the rich. Go break your skull. Constance had moved as far away as possible while remaining on the bench. Pimply Boy burst into bellyaching guffaws. <laughs> She's wrinkling her face at you, Oxford. You are a rat. No, I'm not wrinkling my face at you, sir. My nose itches. I will scratch it. Oxford reached out his hand to touch Constance's face but Rutland knocked it away. Your vulgar grossness goes too far, Rutland said. Mistress Constance will not love a worm, I can see. Look, even now she tries to be fair. Oxford spun his arse on the table and his feet on the bench. Lady, do you not like mischief? Sir, your ways may make some laugh. I see how it is, I see. Yet Bacon and I must learn our Seneca, and this is the place for studying. Oxford opened a book on the table and pored over it. Bacon, grinning, sat beside him. It was a shame that Lady Mildred's nephew was plagued by so much pus, but with Lady Anne Bacon as his parent, a good match would be had, even if he were a dwarf. Mistress Constance, Rutland said clumsily, you have come to use the library and are searching for a poem. Can I help you find the one you search for? It is a poem about a woman who, though she loves... Cannot see the man. Rutland's blank expression told Constance that her attempt at code was utterly unperceived. Rutland's feeble mind does not know poetry, Oxford blurted. I tell you, the giant of the rent heart is Sir Thomas Wyatt, a versifier with no rival. If you are looking for a poem, mistress, Wyatt is your man. The mention of the name worked on Constance like the hunting horn on a hound. Sir, you are fashion's bootlicker. For deep expression of the tortured heart, Grimold is the finest, Rutland challenged. Grimold! Grimold! Grimold is doggerel. 
poetry of the cucking stool, Oxford sniggered. Mistress, you must settle this, he demanded. We will have a trial, and you will choose the finest poet between Wyatt and Grimold. Boring his eyes into Constance, Oxford dramatically recited, Suffice not, madam, that you did tear my woeful heart, but thus also to rent the weeping paper that to you I sent, whereof each letter was written with a tear. Could not my present pains, alas, suffice your greedy heart, and that my heart doth feel torments, that prick more sharper than the steel, but new and new must to my lot arise. Use then my death, so shall your cruelty Spite of your spite, rid me from all my smart, and I no more such torments of the heart feel as I do. This shall you gain thereby. Peacock, said Rutland, taking up a great book and beginning to search. I have not committed to memory as much verse. My mind is full of other matters. Total's miscellany, Constance looked over Rutland's shoulder at the title. Mistress Constance, surely you have read from it? I have not. Constance felt unworldly. She had spent hours studying the instruction of a Christian woman, but never this sort of secular fun. Here are the words of Grimald, Mistress Constance, Rutland said. Love is a fervent fire, kindled without desire. Short pleasure, long displeasure. Repentance is the higher, and pure treasurer without measure. Love is a fervent fire. Oxford seized the Tottles miscellany from Rutland and shot back with another Wyatt poem. What rage is this? What fervour? Of what kind? What power? What plague doth weary thus my mind? Within my bones to rankle is assigned. What poison pleasant sweet? Lo, see, mine eyes flow with continual tears. The body still away, sleepless it wears. My food nothing, my fainting strength repairs, nor doth my limbs sustain. To cureless scar that never shall return, go to, triumph, rejoice thy goodly turn. Thy friend thou dost oppress, oppress thou dost, and hast of him no cure, nor yet my plaint no pity can procure. Fierce tiger fell, hard rock without recure, cruel rebel to love. Once may thou love, never be loved again, so love thou still, and not thy love obtain. So wrathful love, with spites of just disdain, may threat thy cruel heart. Oxford slammed the book shut and looked at Constance expectantly. Of course all these poems have merit, she said carefully. God rot it, exploded Oxford. Constance ejected her polite stance. True then. Why, it is by far the better poet. Which I have long known, countered Rutland, but I cannot stand for such frippery to be unchallenged. I will venture more, boasted Oxford. I have penned verse to show why it's power a spitball next to my cannon. Wait here. And Bacon, come, you may carry my sheaths of paper. He lacks confidence, Constance sighed. Quickly, my lord, I must tell you how it happened. Mistress St. John took the ring. And, sir, I lie not. She kissed it. Rutland did not smile as she assumed he would, but began rubbing his knees, and a look of impatience pursed his lips. So she added quickly, The end is very sad. She says you cannot come to her. It is not possible. He was dumbfounded. I am the third Earl of Rutland. Sir, I cannot answer you. She said her guardian, the Earl of Bedford, would not like it. He smiled, shrugged, and stretched himself out next to Constance on the bench in a way that she felt she must actively ignore. Mistress St. John will receive me, he reflected, and I will win over her guardian. This coyness is natural in a lady of such quality. Love must have obstacles, or it is no love at all. That is not true. Love brings peace, does it not? Never. Have you not read Pyramus and Thisbe, the Ovid, Plutarch, and Chaucer? Our library was not as grand as this. I have not yet been introduced to those writings. It is a crime. You must embark on it. I will give you one a week, and then we may talk of them. Some passages are difficult, but I see you are a clever lady. I will riddle it out. Constance had never had such an interaction. The unplanned generosity, the fearlessness, lending precious books to a person he barely knew. Now, take my lady love a poem from me. 
We must find a sweet verse, one to charm her. That will be your first task. I hazard there are not many. I believe poets prefer to skewer their hearts on a poker. He laughed at that, and she leaned over his shoulder to read the Toddles miscellany. Grimold, he said, I cannot use one of his since you judged him so harshly. Yet this is a beautiful epitaph. Cannot send an epitaph? She would think you look to her death. But listen, man, by a woman learn, this life, what we may call blood, friendship, beauty. By all accounts, it does not exaggerate the lady's worth. Who was this she? Margaret Lee, that was Margaret Wyatt, sister and confidant to my Lord Oxfart's favourite poet. Do you not know the dramatas personae? Rutland teased. Inside, Constance's heart was pounding. So this was Wyatt's dearest sister? She of the letter? Rutland squeezed her hand gently and let go. You look stricken. I have offended you, and you have been such a good soul, Mistress Constance. You are gracious, sir. What about this one by Wyatt? Rutland burst out. The lively sparks that issue from those eyes, against the which there availeth no defence. You sound so true, proclaimed Constance. I am true, Rutland pounded his fist. You must guide me in all my choices. When you read, mark the poems that will make me sound the best. He went to gather paper and quill. Constance returned to the epitaph. It was dated 1555. What of Margaret's letters? Were they kept? And if so, where was the other side of the correspondence with her brother? Rutland reappeared beside her. This verse is a measure of my feeling in such perfection. It is as if my pen were possessed and writ the juicy spell my love cast on me. Using his manliest curly cue, Rutland began to copy the poem. Thomas Wyatt had a sister, Margaret, and she is the dear sister of the mysterious letter. And Margaret Wyatt's epitaph, written by Nicholas Grimald in Tottle's Miscellany, leads Constance to the clue. So as we've talked about before, Constance has had a great education in religious classics, but she hasn't read a lot of poetry. But these wards of Cecil House, these cool guys, they would be up on whatever was the trend of the moment. So our lads are reading from the mega bestseller Songs and Sonnets, better known as Toddles Miscellany. This collection of poems was the first printed anthology of English poetry, and it wasn't new in 1565. It was first printed in 1557, but it had legs. It was reprinted throughout the 16th century, and all the Elizabethan poets read it. John Donne, Edmund Spencer, and the Bard himself William Shakespeare. And we know that because one of the grave diggers in Hamlet sings a song from the miscellany. And in The Merry Wives of Windsor, the fool Slender says, I had rather than 40 shillings, I had my book of songs and sonnets here. Hmm. The name Toddles Miscellany sounds kind of romantic to me. When I first heard it, I thought it was sort of saying Toddles Daydreams. That's funny because I actually thought the term miscellany sounded a little bit like a put down as if the words in it were odds and ends, miscellaneous stuff, like the bits of garlic left in the bottom of your refrigerator drawer. But not at all. This was a very, very, very important book. And these poems had been circulating among courtiers for two decades before this book was published. Miscellany is just another word for anthology in this context. It's not a romantic title. Richard Tottle, the man behind the anthology, acted in the capacity of printer, editor and publisher. Tottle collected the poems in the miscellany from all the unpublished, handwritten, private collections of poetry. It's really hard for us to imagine a time when poets, when writers, didn't print their work and sell books for money. But people like Sir Thomas Wyatt and Henry Howard Earl of Surrey, they wrote only for fame at court. They liked to circulate their poems among their peers. They didn't write for fame among the general population. Their poetry was copied out and circulated among their peers. As we've said in other episodes, writing and sharing poetry was a fun pastime, and it became very popular in the 1530s when Anne Boleyn was queen. Luckily, some of these handwritten manuscripts still survive. And one of the most interesting is the Devonshire Manuscript, so-called because it ended up in the collection of the Duke of Devonshire. It wouldn't have been called the Devonshire Manuscript by the women who started it. Because actually it was originated by Mary Fitzroy, who was married to Henry VIII's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. 
So Mary Fitzroy was the sister of Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, who we already talked about as a great poet and a courtier. The manuscript started life as an empty book owned by Mary Fitzroy, and she asked her friends, including Anne Boleyn's cousin, Mary Shelton, and Lady Margaret Douglas, to write poems in it. I really like the idea of Mary Fitzroy going down to the equivalent of a stationery store and buying a blank book to have some fun with her friends. Anyway, some of the poems in the Devonshire manuscript were original and written on the spot, and some were copies of verse by popular poets at court, like Sir Thomas Wyatt, Henry Howard, and Nicholas Grimald. Right, and Mary Fitzroy, Mary Shelton, and Lady Margaret Douglas wrote comments about the poems in the notebook. An admirer wrote a poem for Mary Shelton. This was a very common thing to do. The poem was copied out in the notebook and Mary, judging by her comments, was pretty unimpressed by it. She like <laughs> took him down in the notebook. It's a little hard. You yeah, said so these were young people, as Jessica would say, <laughs> circulating this notebook. They were all in their late teens and early 20s and this was entertainment for them. They loved what they called a verse conversation. A poem would be written down, and when it was shared, the next person would write an answer to the previous poem. It wasn't an intellectual exercise or criticism. It was having fun. And Wyatt, Surrey, Lady Margaret Douglas, and Mary Shelton also annotated the verse. And occasionally, Lady Margaret Douglas and Mary Shelton disagree on the worthiness of a poem in the Devonshire manuscript. On one, Margaret writes, forget this, and Mary writes, it is worthy. So they're having a little competition about whether this poem is worth anything or not. This poetry was being written and circulated for decades before it was printed and disseminated. They did not have the goal of wide readership. Yeah, I think it was probably, honestly, a class thing. These courtiers valued the opinions of other courtiers, but they had no interest in being popular with what they considered the lower classes. And I mean those of the other classes who could read. Which grew a great deal during Elizabeth's time. Literacy. Yes, yes, many more people could read. In 1557, Richard Toddle, who was known as a publisher and a printer, collected the verses from all these handwritten notebooks circulating at court, and he printed them. And so here we have this first real anthology of English poetry. He published 271 poems. None That's of a which, lot. Yes, and none of them had ever been printed before publicly. And he set himself up as kind of a hero, saying, and I quote, because it restest now, gentle reader, that thou think it not evil done to publish to the honor of the English tongue and for profit of this studious English eloquence, those works which the ungentle hoarders up of such treasures have heretofore envied thee. I love the ungentle hoarders up of such treasure have heretofore envied thee. Because basically he's saying, people, I hope you don't think I'm wrong to celebrate our fabulous language by selling the beautiful poems that these nasty rich people have kept to themselves. <laughs> he thinks he's a Robin Hood. Yeah, exactly. Taking these written works that were only for the elites and giving them to everyone. Poetry was very alive at the time. That's what we wanted to capture in this poetry duel that we have in the story between the Earl of Rutland and the Earl of Oxford. Exactly. They each have their favorites. Just as now people have their favorite musicians and they like to argue over the best guitar lick. Richard Tuttle made money. And as we said, the book was a mega bestseller. There were at least seven editions. And to be fair, he was visionary. He believed that regular people would enjoy poetry. He thought it shouldn't be limited to the upper class. And also it was secular. He was a humanist despite everything. And I think he deserves a great deal of credit for gambling on the idea that regular people would just buy books of poetry to read. Although, also it was a chance to get a glimpse of courtiers close up. So perhaps it was also like reading a president's memoir. Or maybe it was like a Hollywood star since the aristocracy were the rich and glamorous of the time. The introduction where he says, you know, that they've been hoarding these po poems up and he's the one who's giving them over to the regular people. That's a great way to sell something too because you're making people feel as if they suddenly have something that they would have never had before. You know, what I really wonder is how Toddle got his hands on all these unprinted poems. I mean, do you think he went around court asking, like, 
bring out your verse, bring out your verse. And then he put it, all those pieces of paper in a big cart and hauled them down to the print shop. It's a good question because did they want to hide them? Did they want him to have them? And I wondered who even had the manuscripts at this point. He compiled things from the Egerton manuscript, the Arundel Harrington manuscript, and the Devonshire manuscript. They must have been scattered all over the country by then. Well, maybe Nicholas Grimmauld helped Tottle to collect these poems. I mean, he was known as a poet himself, and if he wrote Margaret Wyatt's epitaph, he sh certainly must have known her personally. Perhaps he got some of her brother Thomas Wyatt's poems from her or from other connections he had at court. But we won't, we'll never know. It's... It would be very interesting to know how it all came together. Did he and Richard Tottle have to convince people to give them the poetry? Mm -hmm, yeah. Did they have them in their possession already? Were they happy to share it? Ooh, maybe they had to steal it. Oh, that seems far-fetched. I know, but I kind of like the idea of Tottle and Grimmauld wanting to share all this poetry with the common folk so much that they, they go undercover to steal it. <laughs> Woodward and Bernstein and the Watergate papers. <laughs> yeah, sure, poetry gate. Okay, why not? <laughs> but in terms of the Devonshire manuscript, we know Mary Fitzroy was dead. Mary Shelton might have had it. She lived until the 1570s. Yeah, I, I actually think it might have been in the possession of Lady Margaret Douglas, later the Countess of Lennox, who features so much in our book, because one of the last entries in the Devonshire manuscript is by Lord Darnley, her son. And it was probably a poem written to woo Mary, Queen of Scots. So this idea of writing poetry for people and giving people poetry obviously continued through the ages. The manuscript was especially personal to Lady Margaret Douglas. It contains a back and forth verse conversation between herself and her true love, Sir Thomas Howard, which was written in the 1530s when they were both in the Tower of London. Put there by Henry VIII, of course. So in 1536, when Anne Boleyn had her downfall, both Mary Tudor and Elizabeth Tudor were taken out of the line of succession. That meant until Henry had a living child with Jane Seymour, Lady Margaret Douglas was the next in line to the throne. And as we've said in a previous episode, she was the daughter of Henry's sister, Margaret Tudor, and her second husband, Lord Douglas. Because she was so close to the throne, it was a big problem when she became secretly betrothed to Thomas Howard without the king's permission. Howard was not considered high enough up to marry Margaret, and it was an issue that Lord Thomas Howard was related to Anne Boleyn. Anyway, Henry VIII had the unlucky couple thrown in the tower, and to pass the weary hours, they wrote poetry back and forth in the folio that we now call the Devonshire Manuscript. None of those poems were actually chosen by Richard Tuttle to be in the miscellany, though, but they are in the Devonshire Manuscript. It's a romantic idea passing this notebook back and forth from their prison rooms. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure Mark I wonder who I wonder who ferried it back and forth, a servant. Uh, maybe and, Mary Shelton. Maybe uh, maybe one of their friends, but And I'm sure Margaret held on to the manuscript. I mean she never saw Lord Thomas again because he got sick in the tower and died. And I just wanna say that we've spoken before about how Elizabeth is always criticized that she was so cruel if one of her ladies-in-waiting didn't marry with her permission and that was because she was vain and resented other women being able to have you know true love but no that's not why it's just the same as what Henry VIII did right if you were anywhere near the line of succession or if you were a high noble you had to get permission from the king that from the monarch and from his count his or her council to get married it, that was just the way it was yes it wasn't arbitrary it was it was a rule but do, what did thomas howard die of it seems like when you got in the tower it could be pretty easy to to die they don't really know and margaret got sick at the same time but she survived i wonder if it was the sweat poor hypochondriac brigitta is so afraid constance has in the beginning of the reading today <laughs> it could be anyone who's read a lot of tudor history has come across this term the sweating sickness there's a lot about it in Wolf Hall. Cromwell's family dies of it. Yeah, and Henry VIII had an understandable paranoia about it. It did seem to strike rich people more often than poor people, which was uncommon. But I just thought sweating sickness was another name for the plague. It's an entirely different illness, and it, it mainly occurred in England. 
So no wonder poor Brigitte is feeling nervous about it. It had a sudden onset and really was something you could die of in a day. Fine at breakfast, dead by supper. The plague usually took a little longer to kill you. And while the plague was more deadly, the sweat must have been equally terrifying because it was so quick and it seemed to come out of nowhere. It's never really been discovered what caused this sudden sweat. Some modern researchers think that it might have been a form of hantavirus or possibly anthrax. Wow. So according to the 16th century accounts of John Caius and other physicians, the symptoms of sweating sickness were, first, a sense of dread. A sense of dread? Is that really a symptom? If I thought I might have an illness that would kill me in a number of hours, I too would experience a sense of dread. Doctor, I'm feeling very freaked out. <laughs> ah, it's the sweat. <laughs> That's what he said. Of course, you wonder if he asked his sick patients as they lay in their beds, how did you feel before this all started? And they said, I felt a sense of dread. <laughs> Self-reporting. That's highly doubtful. Then is now. After the sense of dread came cold shivers, which were quite violent, mm. extreme pain in your arms and legs, shoulders and neck, a headache, dizziness, exhaustion. And then death. Unfortunately, yes. What would you rather die of, the plague or the sweat? How about a quick death tumbling from my horse? No, 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 not one of the choices. Ugh. Oh, gosh. Okay, I guess the sweat then, because it was fast. What about the sense of dread beforehand? I would feel a sense of dread of sickness the whole time I lived in Tudor England, every minute of the day. But anyway, listeners, tell us your choice on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. Would you rather die of sweat or the plague? That's a horrible choice, but you got to make it. Let us know. We'll leave Constance and Rutland reading poetry together, not dying of the sweat <laughs> no. or the plague, having a nice time. Or falling from their horse. Or falling from their horse. So just join us next time, and we will be going back in time in our Tudor Time Machine yes. to the court of Henry VIII. Yes, yeah, so join us for our next podcast and leave a comment on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. And please consider becoming a Podbean patron. On the Podbean page, you can see the perks of supporting us, and we'd be so grateful. All our gratitude for listening. And remember, then, then is now. now.